Gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Senator and Dr. Tim Scott to the podium as our commencement speaker this evening. Hello, Liberty! Before, before I start my prepared remarks, I am caught off guard. Thank you so much for the honorary degree. Obviously, your president graduated cum laude. I graduated thank you, laude. <laughs> now, I want all the thank you, laude's to stand up. If God has done something in your life, I want to hear you shout. I want to hear an amen for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, for the Alpha and the Omega and the beginning and the end. If, if your people wonder how in the world you're here today, I want to hear you say, thank you, Jesus. You see, I believe there are a lot of graduates sitting here today with tears welling in their eyes and a heart full of gratitude. Because if we all knew what God had to do to get you to your seats, we would all stand up and give you a standing ovation. And I thank God Almighty, we live in a country where we are free to praise the living God, the one and true God. I thank God Almighty that I was a neighbor of Dr. Costin. I think I didn't know he could preach like that. My boy can throw down. That, 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 is, that is politically incorrect. Let me say it this way. I am quite surprised and amazed at how fabulous Dr. Costin is in delivering the word of God. Sometimes I get confused up in here. I also am so thankful that Chancellor Falwell and the Falwell family had a vision. Proverbs 29, 18 reminds us that without a vision, people perish. Thank you for a God-sized vision. To Mike Pompeo, a man who loves the Lord with all his heart and dedicated his life to serving our country, God continue to bless you and keep you safe. I was thinking about what I was going to say, but sometimes God just turns it all around. And I was sitting there saying, no, Jesus, no, no, Jesus, no. He says, go do my business. So here I stand and sit it over there. Uh, let me just say three things that if I were sitting in your seats, I would want to know. I consider them the three pieces to the life puzzle that are necessary. Uh, the first piece is simply this. Failure isn't fatal if you don't quit. Now, how many of y'all have failed in your life already? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. If you're not failing, you're not trying hard enough. You see, I understand failure because I have had the experience of failing in business and failing in politics and failing academically. And when I think about the fact that failure isn't fatal if you don't quit, I oftentimes go very quickly to my freshman year. But for me, the reason why I want you to remember that failure isn't fatal if you don't quit is because as a kid who grew up in poverty, in a single parent household, with low self-esteem, and I saw myself as a victim, if you see yourself as a victim, the chances are very high that you're going to fail. But I was blessed to move into my grandfather's house when I was seven years old. 
And my granddaddy grew up in the segregated South in the 1920s, and by the time he was in the third grade, his education was over because he was told there was no need for an educated black boy. But he looked me in my eyes and delivered a powerful message. He simply said, you can be a victim or you can be victorious, but you can't be both. But then he told me, we have already chosen victorious for you. And I thank God for that. Now, my grandfather, who left the third grade without being able to read, to go pick cotton, lived long enough to watch his grandson pick out a seat in Congress. And that's why, <laughs> praise the living God, And that's why I say from cotton to Congress in one lifetime, because all things are possible if you believe in God and dedicate yourself to his service. And my grandfather taught me that. How many of y'all believe that the road from cotton to Congress was not always an easy road? Only about 12 of y'all, okay, let me just educate the other 99.3% of the people sitting here today. Well, as that freshman in high school, I talked about failing isn't fatal. My freshman year in high school, I failed four subjects. I failed world geography and civics. Civics is the study of politics. <laughs> Tells me God has a sense of humor. Now, I've been in the United States Senate for 10 years, and I'm not the only one failing civics in America's <laughs> capital. Can I get an amen? I also failed Spanish and English. If you fail Spanish and English, don't nobody call you bilingual. <laughs> they all call you bi ignorant because you can't speak in any language. That's where I found my unhappy self. But as you would imagine, God had a major blessing in my mama. And so to all the mothers in the house, so to speak, today, May God continue to bless each and every one of you because we all deserve to say thank you to our mamas right now. Now, my mama believed that prayer was the key. She did spend a little too much time for my blood in the book of James because she read, if you lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. And after my freshman year, she introduced me to this thing called a switch. I'm not sure if you could find that in the book of James or not. But a switch is a southern apparatus of encouragement. And she applied it liberally all over my legs. I was thoroughly encouraged, so I went to summer school, caught up with my class, and never failed another subject for the rest of my life. <laughs> Let me end this point with this. Failing is inevitable. Being a failure is a choice. My second piece to the life puzzle comes out of Proverbs 31.8. And it basically says, <clears throat> if you want to stand out in life, stand up for those who cannot stand for themselves. And I can't think of a better time for the body of Christ to stand for our Jewish brothers and sisters 
in the United States of America on college campuses. I'm sick and tired of seeing anti-Semitism on college campuses spread like a cancer. I think it's high time that we tell the colleges and universities that allows for Jewish genocide to be spoken and the call for mass murder to those colleges and universities, your federal funding is a privilege. It is not a right. What is a right is for every single Jewish student to walk to their class safely. What is a right is for every Jewish student to study in the library at peace. We should take the money from those universities and colleges that continue to spew hate and give them to a God-fearing place called Liberty University. But you can also stand up for people who can't stand for themselves, like my good friends Molly and George Green. Molly has gone on to be with the Lord, but they sold their successful business in Charleston, South Carolina, and decided to spend the rest of their lives providing water to desperate Africans through their ministry, Water Missions International, they have allowed for hundreds of millions of gallons of water to flow into homes, giving clean water to desperate folks. Or if you want to stand up for those who can't stand for themselves, you can follow my mama, who started her own nonprofit to help other single mothers learn how to be better single mothers and to give them a support group. Everybody can help somebody experience the love of the Lord. And that's how we hear Matthew 25, 21, well done, my good and faithful servant. And my final piece, if you want to walk on the water, you gotta get out of the boat and take some risks. You know, if you look at Matthew 14, Peter decided to get out the boat. He kept his eyes on Jesus for a little while, and then he took his eyes away and he started to sink. Jesus reached his hand out. For us, to impact the world more than the world impacts us, we've got to keep our eyes on the living God, Jesus Christ. It won't work any other way. You see, the world we're living in has lots and lots of bad news. War in Ukraine, conflict in the Middle East, China, aggression towards Taiwan, inflation eating away at paychecks. But we ought not be surprised because John 10.10 10 tells us that there is a thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But that's not the end of the verse. Christ has come that we might have life to the full. That's good news. If there's a fight being waged, I'm going to be on the side of the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and I'm going to believe that greater is he who is in me than he who's in the world. That's our spiritual heritage. You see, I think back to David, who was just a shepherd boy but he decided he would walk on the water and become king. I think of Abraham, who laughed when God said he would be the father of many nations. But at 99 years old, 
he became a father of Isaac. And I think of the beauty queen, Esther. And we are all familiar with Esther 4.14 for such a time as this who delivered the Jewish people because she had the intestinal fortitude to make a stand, and she said, if I perish, I perish. For us to live out our God-designed lives, we are going to have to keep our eyes so focused on the Lord that we can literally or figuratively walk on the water. But it's not just in the biblical times that we can find examples of people who walked on the water. I think of the Green family of the Hobby Lobby fame. Back in the 80s, business was so tough that Mrs. Green was ironing clothes for money. But we fast forward to 2024, and they've spent billions of dollars investing in Christian ministries. I think of my good friend David Stewart, who grew up during the era of segregation. No indoor plumbing. They would take coal and put it in the stove to warm their house. He is today America's second wealthiest African-American, somewhere around $9 billion. And he says, my favorite verse, Tim, is Ephesians 3.20. He knows that God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly and above all that he asks or imagines. Or Truett Cathy, the founder of Chick-fil-A, you know, eat more chicken, you know that one? Well, Truett's first restaurant was called the Dwarf House. And when he was unsuccessful and working really, really hard, 36 hours in a row one time, trying to figure out how to be successful. Here's why I think it's so important for us to get out of the boat. Because someone somewhere might need your big dream, your test of faith to deliver them from their circumstances. And I want to close with Matthew 25 and 44 and 45. And it's very simple. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? Truly, I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Let us be the generation of believers who believe in the impossible. Let us focus our attention, class of 2024, and believe that, like Bella Robertson, who's graduating with us today, believes that God has a plan for her life. Or like Louise Mattis from the Dominican Republic, who my man just said, who, who is, who's he talking about? Louise, stand up here. Let me just see your face. From the Dominican Republic. I can't understand the word he says, but hola. So I failed Spanish. Y'all remember that, right? So literally, God had a plan to get him to America so that he could be here today because God's plan doesn't stop at the boundaries of the United States of America. I think about one of my former interns, Marcel Maluski, who's with us today. His family has come from Poland to watch him graduate. Or Logan Young, 
who's with us today from my home church of Seacoast. You see, God has a plan for every single graduate in the house. My only question as I listen to the chaplain, president, doctor's sermon is this, will you answer his call? God bless you.